Good morning and welcome to Escafia Online. This is Chef Thomas with our topic today on uh, classic soups to modern soups. What a fantastic uh, time to uh, investigate a little bit into the classical soups and uh, then I'm going to finish off with some of the fantastic modern soups which are very common nowadays even, um, even during the summertime uh, when we look at different temperatures and so forth. But let's start with the very basics. There is a part of classification going on with uh, soups. So I will go kind of like old style and teach you and um, mentor you in understanding uh, the different types of soups and then also how they are basically made. So very simple, the first classification group we want to go through is clear soups. Under these clear soups, there are some very, very common soups you probably make all your life. One of them is um, kind of a clear broth soup. Now these clear broth soups can come in different variation. The first one I want to talk about is a consomme. A consomme is nothing else than a stock uh, fortified with uh, clear meat. Now I have all the ingredients for the clear meat right here in front of me and I want to go through these uh, ingredients quickly before I show you a picture of the finished soup. So at my table here, you can see uh, for the clear meat uh, all the necessary ingredients. First of all, we're going to talk about a simple mirepoix. Mirepoix is nothing else than celery, carrots, and onions. We talk about about um, you know 50% uh, onions, 25% celery, and 25% carrots. We also have a turnip here, and then we have eggs, and we have ground up meat. Now this ground up meat here is uh, chicken. So this would lend itself really well for a consomme meat with chicken broth uh, or chicken stock. So when you think about possibly when you made that white stock, the chicken stock, uh, there were some impurities in most of your um, uh, assignments. These impurities need to come out if you really want to serve this soup. And you will need some egg whites, the meat, julienne carrots, julienne celery, and julienne onions. You can throw in some turnip or other vegetables. The key is that these should be cut in julienne, so, or fine julienne. So it could be a 16th by 16th by 2, or an 8th by an 8th by 2. From the eggs, you only need the egg whites. What you do is you take all these ingredients, your julienne mi mirepoix and other aromatics, your meat, your egg whites, and then you mix them together. And you have to have them react. And you need some acidity for this reaction. Um, what it does is basically breaks down the albumin of the egg whites and makes it more palatable to uh, all the other ingredients. This magical ingredient is an acidity and can either be added with tomatoes or with lemon juice, a vinegar, or wine. So if you think about it, if it's going to be a white stock for a chicken consomme and you want to keep that golden color, tomato is probably not the proper product. So in that case, I would probably go with a vinegar, with a white wine, or with a little bit of lemon juice to break down an albumin. What you do next is very simple. You take this clear meat after it's set for a couple minutes, and you actually mix it with the cold stock, and then you bring it together to a boil. I used to teach my students to bring it to 120 and keep stirring it, and after it reaches 120, uh, it will be uh, starting coagulating and actually filtering all the impurities out with the raft. And the raft is now not like a white water raft. The raft is actually considered the clear meat cooked. So it actually swims up to the bottom, uh, sw swims up to the top, and uh, it builds a raft. And this raft then has all the impurities in it. My grandma used to use this raft and actually put in little crostinis and actually eat that. Uh, that is perfectly fine. You can actually season it up, and uh, you don't have to throw it away. So one of these fantastic soups you make out of this would be a uh, chicken noodle soup. And uh, when you look at the picture of a chicken noodle soup, it is a very clear uh, consomme with the garnishes in it. Uh, another, uh, another soup which is very common for a clear broth soup is beef barley. Uh, beef barley soup is uh, a clear beef broth with cooked barley in there. And uh, we have also a picture of that. And um, this beef barley soup is um, 
consisting of a beef broth or beef consomme with cooked barley and other ingredients, mirepoix most of the time, and then beef pieces. So if you add any of these ingredients, any of these garnishes into a clear consomme, you want to make sure that the product is cooked already, uh, that these products are cut nicer, and uh, that they actually showcase your skills. Um, there would be nothing worse than having a clear bowl of soup with some unform, ununiform, and, and weird looking, non-dimensional uh, mirepoix. So we really want to make sure that you understand at this point presentation is key on the knife skills. A fine paisan cut, you know, remember paisan is about an eighth, uh, an eighth thick and can be an, a quarter to a quarter size. It could be diamond shape, it could be a triangle, it could be uh, a, a square. And, uh, or rondeau. These cuts are the ones you want to use. Uh, also brunoise, there's a very famous soup called consomme and brunoise. The brunoise cut for all your mi mirepoix and then add it to the clear soup. So another clear, vet a clear soup besides the um, consomme and the beef barley soup would be a basic vegetable soup. Um, you cook the vegetable broth, again you cook uh, the vegetables for the broth separately and then for the garnish separately. You don't want to use the vegetables or even the meat you used in the stock production and the broth production for the garnish. Um, that would be too leached out, the flavor would be gone and most of the time the texture is not, not, not appropriate. So when you make clear soups, remember, cook the garnish separately and uh, cook the broth separately. And if you want to clear, use clear meat. Now, some of you maybe think, okay, well, how do I get a vegetable st stock clear? If it's true vegetarian vegetable stock, you cannot use meat in your clear meat, obviously. Uh, some of you will probably not gonna use egg whites. And there's other binding materials you can use. Gelatin would be one of them. But it is very hard to get a vegetable stock clear with any of these ingredients. Coffee filter would be my first choice to just put the broth through a coffee filter to get the impurities off the vegetables. Um, most of the time for a vegetable broth, uh, the vegetable stock is very clear and uh, it should not even need any clarification. All right, so that would be our clear soups. So we have your broth, we have your consomme, uh, that could be either with meat or without meat. And let's go now to the thick soups. The thick soups are very fun. Uh, the most common one <coughs> is probably a cream of mushroom soup. The cream of mushroom soup is um, a soup which has been uh, fortified with a cream, and uh, we have thickening agent in there. The thickening agent could also be a roux, but we finish off the soup definitely with a uh, cream, and that makes it kind of a cream off. We, can, we have a lot of cream offs, right? We have cream off broccoli, cream off mushroom, cream off asparagus. Uh, the key is that we use cream to finish this uh, soup off. The thickening agent still can be a roux. Uh, remember, roux is equal parts fat and flour cooked together. Now, another way how to make a cream or thick soup is also to use a base mother sauce. Uh, in most restaurants, or a lot of restaurants, a velute or a bechamel sauce is used as a base for these thick soups. Why? Very simple. I don't make just one cup of velute sauce. I make 5, 10, 15, 20 gallons of velute sauce, and then I use them for sauces, and I use them also for some base material for my soups. Uh, the velouté sauce is nothing else than a white stock, a roux, and some seasonings. Your bechamel is nothing else than a roux and milk. So think about the ingredients in your base sauce and yet any other vegetables to it, any other ingredients, you puree them up or you leave them in the chunky and that can make a very, very successful soup. You can even go as far as making these soups a la minute for your uh, customers. If you don't sell a lot of soup, that might be the way to go. Okay, so thick soups with veluta based or bechamel based, most of them are considered cream soups. The other thick soup, which usually do not have cream nor a thickening agent, is a puree soup. Puree soups, again, very common, uh, very, um, very common in, the, in America. We have uh, lentil soups and we also have bean soups. So we have a pureed uh, bean soup, which uh, uh, shows like all the colors and maybe a little bit of the beans. So this uh, bean soup is um, made by, you know, uh, having some fat, having some bacon, some onions, putting some vegetable stocks on it, putting the beans in there. Sometimes the beans are already soaked. 
you cook them, you puree half of them, and you get some nice texture. This with the puree soups is very interesting because uh, most chefs leave all the substance in the puree soup. So if you think about uh, a black bean pureed soup, we don't strain anything out of it. We puree all the material and it all stays in there. Sometimes for some of the thick soups, we might cook uh, a lot of the uh, ingredients like let's say broccoli or maybe um, uh, you know, uh, mushrooms. We puree them and then maybe even we strain them so that the soup gets a better consistency. That is possible. Puree soups, we usually don't strain. Um, what we do with puree soups is a couple other things. When we don't have a hand blender, a hand blender, you know, like uh, electric, some chefs also use food mills or very rustic, they use a potato stumper, like for mashed potatoes. Uh, what that does to the soup is it makes it very rustic and the pieces are unformed and, and chunky and it gives a, you know, artisanal rustic texture. And some people go for that and then they want that for their soup. So keep that in mind. Again, for the thick soups, if you go with a puree soup, it's a puree of um, beans or lentils. What we do is we cook the ingredients, maybe with a little bit of oil, fat, maybe bacon, um, and then we puree it, food meal blender, uh, any kind of hand tools like a potato masher, and we leave everything in. For our cream-based soups, we either can use a veloute, a bechamel sauce, uh, or we can just start from scratch. Uh, we have uh, cream of mushroom, cream of broccoli, we have any kind of vegetables there. Sometimes they're strained for better consistency and they also hold a little bit better. When you do these cream soups or these thick soups, garnish is always again cooked separately and then added to the soup because we don't want that garnish to get too uh, wet and lose its texture. All right, so we went through the clear soups and the thick soups. This is almost basically at the end, but now we're talking about some soups uh, we consider either ethnic, regional, uh, or international soups. So let us start with the ethnical soups. Uh, ethnical soups are uh, some soups you actually do through our uh, program. Uh, your clam chowder is a, a regional soup, right? It has a particular influence from a region here in America. You have your clams in there, your potatoes, and so on. Chowders are usually seafood based and usually have a thickening agent uh, considering potatoes as the thickening agent. Uh, so this would be a regional soup. An international soup would be a French onion soup. Um, you know, French onion soup, in the picture you see the French onion soup is usually a clear broth. You have your onions in there. You usually have a little cru crustini on top with cheese. Uh, it's baked usually with cheese on top. And um, it, uh, you break through with the spoon and you get like the soup, the onion, and the crostini with that French onion soup. Another uh, fantastic good looking soup is also borscht. Borscht is a Russian-Ukrainian uh, soup. Uh, it's bright red and uh, this borscht is made uh, with red beets. And um, it is a very, very famous soup in uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, another soup you probably have seen on American menus is uh, gazpacho, an uh, Italian uh, offspring of, uh, there's a lot of Spanish influence actually, uh, it's an Italian soup and uh, it has uh, vegetables in it, uh, oil, um, bread, uh, white bread most of the time as a thickening agent, and everything is pureed together. Uh, cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, um, any kind of herbs you can think of, and it gives a very, very yummy, um, yummy, <laughs> A very, very fresh tasting uh, vegetable garden uh, feeling. Um, like there's different variations of gazpachos. When I mean, you can see pictures of uh, red gazpachos or green gazpachos, uh, these uh, soups have been evolved over many, many years. Uh, if you see something more green, probably more on the cucumber, uh, green pepper side. When you see something red, you probably have tons of tomatoes in there, uh, some maybe orange or red peppers and so forth. So the gazpacho, another one of these fantastic national, uh, international soups. Um, gumbo, Louisiana, is actually something uh, French. Uh, there's also minestrone. Uh, you have the other soup uh, you make in our program, minestrone, Italian soup uh, with uh, your beans, your uh, pasta in, the, in a clear soup. So uh, gumbos, minestrones, and chowders are considered also something uh, ethnic or regional and international. Now let's talk about our last 
uh, piece here to the puzzle, which is your modern soups. So we have pictures of uh, a green pea soup. And uh, this green pea soup is actually yogurt based um, with green peas. And uh, it's a puree soup, but it's served cold. So when we switch to um, no thickening agents, uh, we might actually go towards, uh, you know, uh, the, the yogurts, the sour creams, the buttermilks. Uh, and that, those are really beautiful bases for that. Um, another great, great cold soup would be a strawberry soup. So the strawberry soup is something I would tell you to try, try now because it's nice and hot. Uh, so the strawberry soup uh, shows, um, again, it could be a yogurt base. Sour cream is very good. Sour milk is even a very fantastic uh, um, uh, substance to work with with strawberries. And then obviously, you can, you can make this strawberry soup taste uh, in various different um, uh, flavor areas. You can make it minty when you put some spearmint uh, in there with some fresh mint. You can make it more uh, citrusy when you add a little bit more zest or some lemon juice. Uh, the only thing I would tell you about these modern cold soups is, you know, make sure you understand what the base is. Uh, an acidity like lemon juice and a uh, dairy product could cause the dairy product to start uh, reacting and, you know, would get flaky and would break. Uh, so you want to make sure that you don't add too much acidity to those things. Uh, sweetening products, instead of just loading it up with sugar, try something like agave nectar. Try something like natural honey. Um, these uh, ingredients suit themselves more for modern cold, uh, cold, uh, cold ingredient for cold soup than uh, just plain simple sugar. Um, think about other ingredients like melons. There's a wide variety of melons out there. Watermelon, I mean this literally all you have to do is put in a blender and makes it soup by itself and strain it. Um, when you take these techniques, these cream or thick modern cold soup techniques and you take it a step further you could actually make very easy broths or what we also call waters. Uh, now the easiest one would be anything with melon. All you have to do is parade a melon up, put it in a sieve and let this sit overnight and it will collect the water, the essence of the melon in the bottom of a, a bowl. And you can use that for a clear cold soup. Um, if you think about any modern soup uh, on the hot side, um, any basic classic soup you can think of, which you incorporate some new ingredients, or maybe a little twist on the technique when it's made, could or be already considered a, a modern soup. If you look at modernist cuisine or molecular gastronomy, these soups could look completely different. Now we're talking about maybe a chowder, which is a foam. Maybe we look at a gazpacho, which is an air and maybe some spherification. So there is no end to uh, trying new ways of presentation or new products for classic techniques or for modernist uh, soup. So in recapping uh, for today's lesson, we had the classification of soups. We have your broth soups and your thick soups. We talked about some regional international soups and then the modernist soups. Please. Never forget, if you have any questions about any of these or any other lessons, you can always email us and you can always call us. Please try some of these cold soups. Uh, for the holidays, it's fantastic. Again, watermelon is probably the easiest bet to just puree up and strain and see what's coming out there. Um, add some ingredients. Wine is always good. Some sweetener. And you will have a fantastic, refreshing uh, cold soup for the summer. Thank you so much, and I hope I see you soon again.